Storyworthy is one of the best books on storytelling that I've ever read. It's embarrassing how many things are underlined in this book. No, literally, the most tactical advice on how to tell a compelling story was documented by this man named Matthew Dix. It's insanely tactical and breaks down the psychology of why story works. Now, Matthew is a best-selling novelist, 36-time Moth Story Slam champion, trust me, that ain't easy to do, and five-time Grand Slam champion. For years, he's been teaching the art of storytelling, and he's freaking here today to lay it all out for us. This book is one of the top 10 of books I reference on the regular. Freaking honored to introduce you to the one and only Matthew Dix. I put a note there that one day whenever I talked to you, I was going to ask you because I thought, well, Matt, you said earlier that everybody's interesting. So what makes somebody uninteresting? They do not examine their lives for any meaning whatsoever. What I discovered is our lives are filled with stories. Things happen all the time that touch our hearts and our in our minds, like things that really mean something to us, but we throw them all away like they're trash. How do I know that change is interesting enough or good enough for a story? Matt Dix, I told you before, I have had you on my wish list to interview ever since I read this book, which was recommended to me by a friend who's a storyteller. It's called Storyworthy, and I'm sure folks who are watching this right now are very familiar with this book. It is one of the most tactical, I would say almost textbook, on how to tell stories that just really shifted the way that I view storytelling. I thought I was a good storyteller until I read this book. And I was like, damn, I'm doing everything freaking wrong. It is a freaking honor, man, to have you on the show. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm sure you're doing a fine job. I'm sure you could, everyone can improve, but I'm sure you were fine. No, I'm really not. I go to the moth and then we just started a storytelling thing here in Augusta. And I ended this story on what I thought was a really funny joke. And when I was rereading through your book, mm. I read the part. It's like, you never end a story on no. a joke. And I was like, damn it. I yeah. just did that. Well, people don't want, people come to a story for humor, but ultimately they want to have something land in their heart or their head. You know, they want to feel something. And so then to end with a joke sort of, I think, undermines the meaning of a story by like sort of the last bit that you're leaving them with is a little bit of candy, you know, candy cane yeah. or, you know, cotton candy, nothing that you want them. You want them to be feeling it and the joke doesn't let them feel it. So I'm jumping ahead here and we'll circle back to your origin story. But with that note, I was just reading, I don't have it here with me, Stephen King's book on, on writing, the book yeah. on writing. It's great. Such a good book. And one of the things that he said in there was, you cannot expect to move an audience without being moved yourself. Mm. And I thought about that with your book of the way you're supposed to end with something that's, you know, in, in the heart. And as a storyteller, I know that as much as we would like to say that our intentions are pure and that, you know, we want to speak from the heart, we want to make people cry. We want to make people feel moved and stuff. And so it's interesting trying to figure out the line between fabricating something that has emotion in it in allowing emotion to come through. And I'm sure with you telling the same stories over and over again and really perfecting it, that's probably been an interesting journey of allowing emotion versus creating it, I guess, and faking it. Do you know what I'm saying? I do. You know, I wouldn't say I fake it. I think that there's two kinds of storytellers in the world. There are some people who, when they tell a story, they're telling a story, sort of conveying the images and the ideas to the audience. And then there are some people who sort of relive the experience when mm -hmm. they tell the story. And I am one of those people. So when I tell you I'm walking across a parking lot on an early Sunday morning, I am right there again. So oftentimes the audience sort of disappears from me and I'm sort of back in that moment. So I have told sort of some of the stories in Storyworthy and others. I've told those stories a hundred times. Yeah. And still, when I get to the end of the story, I feel emotional and people see me become emotional. And it's because I'm genuinely there again in that moment, seeing those things as if they're happening almost for the first time. And how so do you, how do you do that? Talk yeah, it's a good me. question. <laughs> people have asked me that many times. Like, how do I see it, Matt? I think it's a couple of things. I think one is bandwidth, meaning the more um, comfortable you get on stage, the more experienced you get on stage, the more you can sort of push away the thoughts that a lot of people have on stage, which is 
worry and concern and nervousness and all of that mm-hmm. sort of occupies an enormous amount of bandwidth. So you, you don't have as much room to work. And once you get more comfortable or once you stop caring about what other people think or, you know, all of those things, once they get pushed away, you have so much to work with that you can put yourself back in that space and not be concerned about what's, what am I supposed to say next? And Mm. how am I supposed to say it? Once all those, once all those concerns go away, I think that's an easier way to get into the story. But I genuinely think some people are sort of more writers of stories. And so they speak the story as if they're reading it off the page, sort of a mental page in their head. And some people are sort of relivers of stories. And I am just a reliver of story. There's actually sentences that I can't say from stories without becoming emotional, even just by saying that sentence, because that sentence brings me right back to the moment. And that's because it instantly opens a door to that moment for me, a moment of importance in my life. This is a weird ass question. I wasn't planning on asking you, but it just came up for me. I have an acting teacher. And one of the things that she, you know, talks about is, you know, you have to really feel something in order to, I mean, obviously to portray it. So she says, you know, digging deep, deep into things that are, I forgot the term, but substitution, you know, something that's similar to it. And we kind of made a joke in class because it's like, oh man, when you get over something, when you get healed for some, it, damn it, you can't use that as a substitution anymore. And so it was kind of this running joke in class that you want to be able to still have the rawness of emotion because it helps you in your storytelling. But it's interesting too, from like a mental health perspective and just a grown up perspective, like, well, damn, I kind of want to be able to talk about X, whatever, without being moved. So messy question, but I'm curious how you're able to kind of gauge being raw in emotion and then also to not holding on to things that maybe you want to forget. Sure. I guess I don't want to forget anything. You know, I'm obsessed with sort of holding on to everything, homework for life, you know, as my method of holding on to things. What I do is, you know, for example, I tell a story about being homeless for a period of my life. Mm -hmm. And I was homeless because the people who could have helped me didn't. And the people who wanted to help me couldn't. So I ended up, you know, on the street for not that long, six weeks. It felt like forever, but six weeks. And that was a really terrible time in my life that I had a hard time talking about for a long time. Until one day I decided to tell a story about it and turn it into some art and some craft and give it a beginning and an end. So I sort of sealed it off from the rest of my life so it didn't infect the rest of my life. And then when I really examined it, I was reminded of things that I had forgotten which was Mm -hmm. there were people who got me off the street and saved my life, right? And so I was able to honor those people. All of those things sort of happened for me. But when I tell the story of homelessness, even though I've sealed it off, it's still a difficult time in my life if I put myself back in that time. So I sort of put myself into the time and I rid myself of what I know is to come in the future. You know, I can get myself back into that mindset of, living in a car, thinking you're never going to not live in a car for the rest of your life. Mm. And if I can get myself back into that mental state, not aware that at some point you're going to be happily married and you're going to have two kids and a beautiful home and you're going to live in Connecticut, I rid myself of all of those things and just place myself mentally back into that spot. Then as healed as I am, I can return to the space where I was not healed and I can speak from that place and then I can feel those emotions again. Well said. Well said. Well, I jumped into the nerdy tactical questions way too soon without <laughs> giving. Quite all right. Oh man, if I have you this time, I just <laughs> ooh, I want to get as much in as I can. But just to set the table for this book and this new book that you're coming out, with, which I'm really excited about. I just learned about it. Uh, you have been a teacher for quite some time, and you've been doing. Tell me if I'm misrepresenting this, but kind of doing storytelling for a while, quote on the side as a performer. And then we're pretty damn good at it. And then wrote the book and started doing workshops and trainings around storytelling. And you're still a teacher right now. And I thought that was really interesting to me because obviously there's a love and a passion for education still there. But when did the storytelling piece come in where you fell in love with that? Well, you know, I've been teaching for 25 years. It wasn't until... Thank you. Well, I love it. One of my students recently asked me, why are you still teaching? Because he knows I write books and consult. And yeah. My business people tell me, don't go back to school. You're losing money every time you go to that place. But I love the kids. It's genuinely the only reason I teach still. It's really cool. But in 2011, I went to the Moth, you know, the storytelling organization, yeah. the granddaddy of them all in New York. My friends pushed me to go. They were like, you've had a terrible life. Go tell a story about it. They thought I'd be good at it. I know it's a terrible thing. You don't say that to your friends. I've had an unusual life. It's not been terrible, but it certainly has had its ups and downs. But I, I told them I would. And then because I said I would do it, I, I did it, sort of not really wanting to do it. Mm-hmm. And I told a story on a stage 
at a moth in New York City, and I won. And I hated every minute of that evening until I began speaking into the microphone. The moment I started speaking into the microphone, I thought, oh, this is where I belong. Now, I'd been a wedding DJ for 20 years at that point, so I'd been speaking into microphones to large groups of people who had no interest in listening to me also. And, you know, I've been a teacher speaking to people and lots of other opportunities for me to be on stages. I sort of had discounted all of those as not being relevant or helpful when really it all sort of came together for me that night. And that's when I fell in love with it. It certainly wasn't a business for me at that point. For the first couple of years, I was just going to New York and Boston and performing as much as I could. And then in 2013, my wife and I launched our own storytelling sort of organization here in Connecticut. And then businesses started seeing me on stages and saying, come help us with our sales and our marketing and our branding. And at first I thought, I can't help you. Like I just tell stories about myself. I'm just a little storyteller and occasional comedian who does this. But it turns out I met a guy, a business owner here in Connecticut who said, no, you really can help me. And it proved to be true. And so I started working with businesses, you know, occasionally and now constantly. Damn. Now, New York, that's the biggest stage, isn't it? For the moth or am I wrong? I don't know. I mean, I've told stories in New York to 2000 people. So I don't know if there's bigger, there's probably bigger stages. I mean, they're in Australia at the, you know, at the, at Symphony Hall, and I'm sure that's bigger, but you know, it's a great place to tell a story. New York, there's no better place than New York City in my mind. Yeah. I have a listener question later. I'll pop in here. It's his first time telling a story in New York at the Moth, and he sent in a video clip to ask you a question. So we'll do that closer towards the end, but sure. I'm curious, you know, getting up there, some folks will say, yeah, well, you know, that's nice for you, Matt. You were just born with charisma. You were just born (laughs) learning how to tell stories. Good for you. But the thing about this book is you lay out a framework that I would argue anybody could use and follow to become a better storyteller. And I'm curious, like, where did this stuff come from? Is this just your own philosophy? Where did you learn storytelling from? Well, you know, I used to say that I sort of fell into what I fell into something I was good at later in life. How lucky was I? And then my wife heard me say that one day in in a workshop. And she said, that's what you think. Mm -hmm. You think you were just a born storyteller and you suddenly discovered it. And I said, yeah, like in front of everyone. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I think. I I didn't go to school for to be a storyteller. And she said to me, she said, well, first of all, you've been writing every single day of your life since you were 17 years old. I've have, mm-hmm. I have a blog that I've written every single day for 20 years without missing a day. I've published six novels. I write relentlessly stories and essays and all of these things. She says, you don't think that sort of gave you an education into storytelling? And I thought, oh, wow. that's probably true. She said, you were an English major. You read like a thousand books over the course of four years. You don't think that helped you? And I said, that's true. And then she said, you've been a wedding DJ, so you don't have a fear of standing in front of people and speaking extemporaneously, which is really helpful. That yeah. bandwidth idea, right? When I stand in front of people, I don't care. I, I speak fun. Like, there's no nervousness. I'm the only person I know who genuinely takes the stage, and I don't feel an ounce of nervousness when I get on stage because of that experience I've had as a wedding DJ. And then I'm a teacher. So every day I stand in front of the worst audience in the world, which is 10-year-old children, and I am not the best deliverer of content. I don't, I'm not the best teacher in a technical way. I entertain the hell out of children throughout the day through storytelling and through comedy and through silliness. And in all of that, I get them to learn because they love coming to school and watching my antics every day. So my wife points out all of that came together for you, Matt, Mm. that night at the moth. And that's why you won and why you continued to win. It wasn't because you had some natural talent, which is important for people to know, because I didn't grow up on the, on the lap of a storyteller. You know, I grew up in a, dysfunctional home where we were sort of all independent contractors in separate corners of the house that came together occasionally for food. Like there was no storytelling in my house growing up. So it really was the confluence of a bunch of experiences that helped me become, you know, who I am today. I'm glad you brought up or emphasize the importance of writing, because I'll tell you, in my arrogance, in my arrogance, I thought my quirky, charismatic personality was just about enough to get up and tell a great story. And the first few times I got up there, and just fell flat on my face and was embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I realized how important writing is. I mean, not only with, you know, do on stage, but even with my content and coming up with ideas for short videos and the discipline of sitting down and writing, man, it's, I don't know why I resist it so much because it's literally the secret sauce. Well, you're going to hate this though. Oh no. I know. 
I've written, obviously, I write every single day. I've published novels. I've never written anything that I've spoken on a stage before. What? So everything I do on stage is done orally. Every moth story I've told, about 120 of them, none of them are written down anywhere. So I, I practice the story out loud. I craft it out loud and I record it. That's the same though. Recording it? No, writing. You're writing it verbally. Sure, yes. But I do think there's a difference. And I know there's a difference because I write stories for, this, for the page, right? I write novels and short stories and columns for newspapers and magazines. And they're not the same. Because if you take one of my stories that I tell on the stage and you actually, if you actually transcribed it, you would discover that it's a grammatical mess because we don't speak with proper grammar. We don't speak in complete sentences. We don't speak with excellent punctuation. If you were to do all that, it would look like a mess. So I do point out to people who write their stories word for word, which is something I kind of never advise people to do. If you are writing it word for word, you should definitely be speaking it out loud and making sure that it sounds like you and not like the written version of you. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, There's still a lot of preparation there. You're not going up and improving it and relying on your personality. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Well, right? no, no, that's, no, don't tell me. <laughs> no. Well, I do a show here in Connecticut. I have one coming up soon. It's called Matt and Jenny are Unprepared. It's my, my storytelling friend, Jenny and I, we stand on a stage and mm -hmm. we take prompts from the audience. They give us three words. And from those three words, we have to tra tell a true story from our lives that pertain to one of the three words. And we wow. have one minute to come up with it and then we have to tell the story. But what that is really is the preparation of understanding how to craft a story. Because most yeah. stories in the world are not told on stages. 99.9% .9 of the stories you ever tell are told in restaurants and at your home right. and in the car and for me on the golf course, places like that. And so when you become a storyteller, what you do is you start using the strategies that I teach in a very natural way. So I never tell a story without first knowing what I'm trying to say at the end and then reversing it and figuring out what I want to say at the beginning and quickly dividing it into scenes and identifying areas of suspense and surprise. And I can do that almost instantaneously now because I practiced so much. So much. So you are prepared to a certain degree. Jenny and I, when we're on the stage and we don't have a story ready, we don't have the story ready, but we have all the strategies and framework in place. So we're just inserting content into those strategies so that we can entertain an audience. Yeah. So my tendency is to start always with the beginning because I always think about the hook at the top. And I'm talking that more about short form video right now, but you're a hundred percent right. And it's something you teach about starting with the end because without fail, my endings are the freaking hardest because I didn't start there. So I know you talk about a story is really change. So identifying the end, are we identifying the change there? Yeah, because that's essentially what your story is going to be. You don't have a story unless you know how you have either changed as a person or maybe realization, meaning you see the world in a different way. That tends to be most stories actually is I suddenly see myself, the world, my children, my spouse, my house, whatever it is, you see it in a different way than you saw it before. But to have a story, you actually have to experience that moment of change. And so we start at the end because that confirms that we have a story. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're probably just reporting on our lives meaning we're just telling stuff that happened over the course of time. Yeah. And that's not really a story. No one wants you to report on your life unless they're married to you or they're your mother. Uh, but that's what most people do. They just start at the beginning of a moment. You know, how was your day? They say, well, I got to work in the morning. And right away, you know, they're reporting on their life and it's going to be terrible because they're just going to tell you beat by beat what has happened as opposed to a meaningful thing happened at some point in the day. And I want to tell you about the meaningful thing. And I'm going to tell you how it wasn't meaningful at first, and then it became meaningful. Now we have a story. How do I know that change is interesting enough or good enough for a story? If it's important to you or you felt it in a meaningful way to you, you can always make an audience feel it as well. I'm very famous in the moth community for telling the most insignificant moments from my life and somehow making people laugh and cry about them. I love the challenge of taking almost nothing and making people feel it. Because most stories in the world, we don't see them happen when, they experience, when people experience them. Most stories happen like in our minds. We change our mind about something, but there's no sort of car chase. We're not leaping over cliffs. We're not running away from lions. Sometimes we're like standing in a grocery store and we're thinking about something while we're trying to choose between potato chips and Doritos. And suddenly we think about the world in a different way. 
and now we have a story to tell. And mm -hmm. if someone else was in the grocery store aisle with us, they would be staring at us and they would never know that we just had a moment of transformation or realization. They would never mm -hmm. know that we suddenly found the solution to the problem that our child is having and we can't wait to get home and offer that solution to our child. So mm -hmm. most of the time, stories look boring on the outside, so we have to bring them to life in the way that we tell them and the way we bring people into our hearts and our minds so that they can understand them. And then reverse engineering this, you teach for us to start the story as close to the end as possible. Yes, Correct. which is not me, it's Kurt Vonnegut who says that, but yes, when we start our stories as close to the end as possible, the stories get shorter. The shorter, shorter the story, the better the story almost always. So shorter stories are better. And it also tends to just squish everything into a smaller amount of time. So everything feels more potent and more vital and more important when it's in a short period of time. If you think of a movie like Ocean's Eleven, they rob the casino, right? Mm -hmm. If you and I were going to rob a casino, we would take months to plan it right? But that doesn't make for a good movie. What makes for a good movie is two days, plan the robbery in two days, jam everything into 48 hours. Suddenly it's really an interesting and impactful. Spread it out over six months, which is probably what would really happen if we were going to rob a casino, wouldn't be very interesting at all. Right. So the shorter the story, the more um, impactful a story will be. What do you ask yourself as far as the editing process goes about whether a detail is important or not to leave something in? Well, if it doesn't serve the story, it goes all the time. And I try to avoid adjectives at all costs. So I prefer to rely on good hard nouns that my audience can imagine. So if I am standing in a kitchen, the only word I'm going to use is kitchen unless something in the kitchen is relevant to my story. Because if I say kitchen, you're going to put me probably in your kitchen or your parents' yep. kitchen or a kitchen you see on TV. And you can see that kitchen with enormous clarity. Whereas if I tried to assemble a kitchen for you, telling you where all the appliances and the table were, then you wouldn't see it with very great clarity. And I'd steal all that bandwidth from you. You'd have to like keep track of the architecture of the kitchen I have just created. Instead, I just want to use your kitchen because that one's good enough for me. Unless, unless I need the magnets on the refrigerator to be a particular way. And if they do, I'll say that. But otherwise, I'll just say kitchen. And I know that you will visualize it perfectly. So I always believe that the power of your imagination is more powerful than any collection of words that I can assemble. Mm. So if the detail is not important to the story, it goes away. And instead I give the audience a noun that I know they can imagine on their own. One of my favorite tips that has not left me and I'm like, apply it to things I probably shouldn't apply it to. <laughs> it's the very beginning. You said to always start in an action, always yeah. have an action. So I'm telling you, man, when I'm doing a video, when I'm doing almost anything with, with content at all, I always remember that of like starting an action and you're, you're talking about verbally, like the I'm moving, I'm somewhere, something's happening to me. And I love that tip. It was so freaking powerful for those who haven't heard that. Can you explain why the movement is so important? Sure. Yeah. And actually what I tell people is location and action because we want to create a scene too. So always where you are and what's happening. And action doesn't mean much. Some of my stories start with I'm standing or I'm sitting, which is an action, not the best version of an action, but whatever it is. But people want stories to get started. Most stories don't start with action. Most people start stories by teaching us stuff that we don't want to know. So mm -hmm. a story that starts with let me tell you something about my mother. No one's wanted to ever in the history of the world hear the second sentence of that story because they don't care about your mother and they don't want to hear anything about it. Well, let me tell you something about my mother is essentially I'm about to deliver an essay about my mother and no one's right. ever asked for that. Right. But if we start the story with I'm climbing out my bedroom window, I'm 14 years old and I'm running away from home. I'm so sick of my mother. I can't stay here anymore. Let me tell you something about my mother. Well, now I'm in because now I can see a kid climbing out of a bedroom window. I, I'm, I have location and action. And now I don't mind learning about what has caused this action to take place. Just pay attention to the way movies begin. They always begin with action. Someone is doing something. And when there's no action to be had, it's often sort of an aerial shot where we're flying into New York City and then sweeping down Fifth Avenue and then eventually landing in a restaurant where four ladies are having brunch. And that's just the director's acknowledgement that four ladies having brunch is not really action. So I'm gonna fly us into New York City so that you get the sense that you're being swept into the story. So we want people to sort of like be on their heels right off the bat by trying to keep up with the story rather than waiting for it to get started. And then you said, if we're confused how to start 
the beginning, we do the opposite of what the end is. Yeah, that's always the case. Yeah. So whatever, if the end of your story, here's a simple one for me. There was a day a few years ago when I was at a party and my wife said, would you just try Brie, please? It's been 15 years that we've been together and you refuse to try Brie. Just try it once. And I said, fine, I'll try it, but I won't like it. And I tried it and I loved it. And I realized it took me 48 years to try Brie. I've wasted 48 years of Brie eating because I thought it looked terrible, right? So if I want to tell that story, which is not a good story, all I ask myself is at the end of the story, I realize Brie is delicious. What's the opposite of that? Brie is terrible and not delicious. So I just have to pick a moment as close to the end as possible yeah. where I it, like was around Brie and thought it was awful. And so I open with a scene where someone's offering me Brie and I'm doing my usual, like, why would I want to eat a cheese that is surrounded by a hard rind and that you force me to eat the hard rind in order to eat what you say is good on the inside? Like, yeah. no, I'm not investing in that, right? So I would start there. And then eventually my wife gets me to try Brie and I realize I've been stupid all my life. But that's all I do. I just say, what's the moment I just had? And then what's the opposite of that moment? You know, where did I not have that moment? And now I have a story, or at least I have the frame for a story. Yeah. You talk about these small moments. In fact, you said that you, and I'm paraphrasing here, but kind of weary of making stories too big and too many big details, which goes, you know, combats people's resistance. Like, well, I'm just not interesting. I don't have an interesting life. I'm mad. I didn't have a crazy ass life like you did. If you teach to look throughout your day with these little micro moments of stories that you can tell homework for life. I have a question about that, but if you wouldn't mind just laying the groundwork in context of what is homework for life, why do you recommend it? It's complex and big, but simply put, at the end of every day, or honestly throughout my day now, I ask myself what's sort of like the most story-worthy moments from my day. What are those moments that mean something to me? I don't write them all down in story form. I don't want anyone to do that, quite frankly. I, I wanted to create a system where I could capture moments from my life the same way I would brush my teeth, which would be simple, quick, and I'd never skip a day. So I use a spreadsheet. It's two columns. It's the date, and then I stretch the B column across the screen, and it's on that B column that I write what the moment is from the day. My goal was to find one new story per month, 12 new stories per year, I would have been thrilled. Instead, what I discovered is our lives are filled with stories. Things happen all the time that touch our hearts and our in our minds, like things that really mean something to us, but we throw them all away like they're trash. You know, I hear people all the time tell me that time flies and I'm here to report it does not. What happens is this, if I asked you to recall as many days as possible from 2023, most people can probably recall about a hundred days or less from 2023. Some people I've met can't recall 20, like every other day is sort of lost to them. So what happens is when you don't sort of honor each day by noting the things that made it different than the other days, you just throw them away. So a 365 day year, if you can only remember a hundred days from 365, of course time flies because mm -hmm. you've just shrunk your year to a hundred days and thrown away 265 of them. That's why time flies for you. Time does not fly for me. Now I average about 7.8 items in my homework for life every day, meaning 7.8 moments in my day that I think are worth holding on to, yeah. capturing and not letting go of. So what I've done is taken 365 and multiplied it by seven. Time goes by so slowly for me, blessedly slowly, because every mm -hmm. single day is filled with moments that I both recognize and record. And both mm -hmm. of those things are important because most people don't recognize them, including me. Back in 2015, when I started homework for life, I did the math. I was averaging 1.3 moments per day that I was recording. And now I'm averaging 7.8. It's not because my life is more interesting today. It's because I've developed a lens over time to recognize what is worth holding on to. My son says something to me that I never want to forget, or I see something for the first time or the last time, and I don't want to lose that. You know, yesterday my cat disappeared for 12 hours. And my life was basically over for 12 hours. It was like a stone was on my heart. And then he just appeared like a jerk. Just, hello, I've been in the house the whole time. I'm yeah. fine. I was just sleeping somewhere that you could not find me, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a moment. Like, I'll, like, that's a moment that will be lost to me three months from now if I don't record yeah. it. But I do record it because it's reflective. 
of the bizarre attachment that I have to these cats and how if these, something happens to these two cats, my whole life falls apart for a period of time. So mm. I find these moments all the time and many of them become stories, many of them become parts of stories and many of them never become a story, but I hold on to them because every day is worth holding on to. So that's basically homework for life. You can just Google the phrase homework for life and watch my TED talk and learn a lot more about it. Yeah, it's huge. And it's been game changing for me too, because before I read your book, I was under the impression that I was just boring AF. Cause I had no, like I, the three big things that happened in my life, I told stories about and I was out. <laughs> That's all I had. Homework for life, man. It's shifted my mindset drastically. But here's my question about it. You use the argument that when people say, oh, I'm not interesting, I'm boring, la, 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 to use this tool to discover how interesting and rich their life actually is. And then on page 329, if I could just flip over there, you said something along the lines... The world is filled with uninteresting people. I meet them every day. I suspect that in most cases there is an interesting person lurking beneath their unfortunately un uninteresting veneer. I literally yes. look at this. I put a note there <sighs> that one day whenever I talked to you, I was going to ask you because I thought, well, Matt, you said earlier that everybody's interesting. So what makes somebody uninteresting? They do not examine their lives for any meaning whatsoever. <laughs> they mm. continue to plow through. Here's my mm -hmm. favorite example. I'm playing golf with my buddy, Steve, about seven years ago. It's a hundred degrees out. I'm dying. And I left my Gatorade in the car. Okay. And so we're on like the sixth hole. It's this ridiculous hill we have to climb to get to the next hole. And Steve sees that I'm sort of falling apart a little. And he says, Matt, I have an extra Gatorade. Do you want it? And I say, no, I'm fine, which is crazy because it's a hundred degrees and he has an extra Gatorade. And I don't know why I say no, but I do say no, it's crazy. So when we get back to our car, when we're done the round, Steve drives away, but I don't because I'm a storyteller and I'm interested in my life. So I sit in my car and I go, why did I say no to the Gatorade? That's weird. I'm constantly asking myself, why do I do the things that I do? Mm -hmm. So I sit in my car and I think about it for about two minutes. Why would I say no to a Gatorade when I really needed one? And then I understand why. When I was a kid, I was hungry all the time. We didn't have enough food in my home. And so when you're hungry as a kid, what you do yeah. is you never tell anyone you're hungry because it's shameful to not have enough food. And so when people offer you food as a kid, you always say no because you never want to acknowledge that you might need food, right? And so you live your life like that, constantly rejecting the offer of food despite the fact that you're hungry because God forbid someone finds out that you're hungry. Yeah. So that day I realized, oh my God, I'm 45 years old, but I'm also still 10 years old because yeah. I continue at the age of 45 to reject all offers of food. Even though I have plenty of food now, I can give Steve a Gatorade back tomorrow because I learned at a young age to reject the offer of food, I still do it 35 years later. And then I'm able to do two things. I'm able to change that behavior. So now I can accept the gift of food from people without worrying about any shame attached to it. And now I have a story to tell. Most people drive away. Most people go, that was weird that I didn't take that Gatorade. And then they get in their car and they go home and they never take a moment to examine their life and say, why the hell am I the way I am? Storytellers are self-centered in a positive way, meaning we actually afford ourselves some time to think about ourselves. Most people don't do that, which means most people are kind of boring because when it comes time to say something, they only report on their lives. What they say is, Here's a weird thing that happened to me today. My buddy Steve offered me a Gatorade when it was 100 degrees out, and I said, no, isn't that weird? And that's all they say, which is boring. Mm. But if they would sit in the car for two minutes and say to themselves, why do I do the things that I do? Then they would have something interesting to say. So everyone is potentially filled with interesting things to say, and everyone is potentially incredibly entertaining. But most people do not choose to examine their lives in a meaningful way. And therefore, they don't have as much to say. And sometimes it's not their fault. I say a lot of people are sort of focused on their spouses, their children, their businesses, their neighbors, their parents, all of those things. And they don't afford themselves the time that they deserve. And the yeah. guaranteed number one way I can make people cry in my workshops, it's always with women. It's always with women who are a little older when I tell them, I officially give you permission to start thinking about yourself and not about other people for some portion of every it. day. And That'll it always it. makes women cry because women more than men carry the burdens of everyone in the world on their backs. Yep.
And if they would just put that burden down for half an hour and think about themselves, they'd have more to say. So this leads into my next puzzling question about your book that I also underlined. Storytelling is time travel. There we go. Uh -huh. You start this off saying in big letters, by the way, I am not a spiritual person, nor am I drawn to mysticism, transcendental planes, or otherworldly notions. And I was a little confused there because everything that you're saying, and when I read this book, felt like personal development. It felt like spirituality because in order to foster that self-awareness and to tap into something else, because there has to be something else there, man. I'm like, how in the world is he not spiritual? How do you wrestle with what some may call the muse and inspiration and this tapped in this and not be spiritual? Well, I tell people I am reluctantly atheist, okay. meaning I really wish I could believe in God. <laughs> I really wish I could. And I try. I've read the Bible cover to cover three times, which does not help. There's a lot of bad stuff in that book <laughs> that does it's not make me feel any more spiritual than when I began reading it. Okay. And if you don't, if, you, if you're like upset by what I just said, I would say you have not read the Bible cover to cover. Because once you read the Bible cover to cover, there's just some stuff in there that is not good. No offense, God, if you exist, but the chapter about the, the bald man being made fun of by the 42 boys and then God sends two bears to eat 42 boys because they made fun of the bald man. That's mm -hmm. not good. Like there's nothing good to take away from that story whatsoever. And that story exists in the Bible. Just read the book of Kings. It's in there. You're right. You're right. So, so I'm reluctantly atheist in that I would love mm -hmm. to believe in God and I have not managed to find the faith that I so desire. I think though that rather than sort of being spiritual and believing in something outside of this, I just, I kind of believe in people and I, I believe that. in the things that they have inside them. And I believe in the goodness that they hopefully possess and sometimes mm -hmm. exhibit and sometimes do not, but mm -hmm. that's what I believe in now. And I would love to think that there is some larger force in the world guiding and moving and boy, if I die, I hope there's another place to go. But at this point, I don't believe in it, but I'm jealous of people who do. But that's, that's, I think you're talking about like a religious belief. I'm thinking more along the lines of inspiration, that thing that sometimes just waxy in the head. You're like, where did that thought come from? Again, some people call it the muse or whatever. When you, let me just put it this way. When you're, because I'm sure not every single day, you're just filled with awesome ideas and feeling inspired with things. If you say you are, I'm going to be pretty upset. But when you're feeling I guess just like a regular old boring Joe, but you need to show up and be creative and put pen to paper and come up with something. How do you, I guess, stir what some would call the muse? I'm a big believer in the intersection of ideas. So I'm very much an idea collector. I've written a blog every day for 20 years. So the That's other day it was snowing here in Connecticut and I sat down in the morning to decide what to write. And I wasn't really inspired by anything in particular. Sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. I have a, like I have 197 half written blog posts of some form or another. Really, they're just ideas that I haven't like figured out what to do with yet or haven't figured out how to end or haven't figured out how to begin. But because it was snowing, I said to myself, oh, I have a favorite haiku in the world that has to do with snow. So I'll write about that today. So I found the haiku, which was one of those 197 items, which was my favorite haiku. And my plan was to write, it's snowing here in Connecticut today. In honor of this, here's my favorite haiku. And I thought that's all it was going to be. So I, I wrote that much. And then I said to myself, oh, actually, you know what? As a teacher, I know that people think haikus are a five, seven, five syllable poem, but they're not actually. That's just a weird thing that elementary school teachers do to teach syllables. And I said, oh, I'll point that out to people. So I wrote, by the way, if you want to write a haiku, it has nothing to do with syllables. It's uh, two lines that send you in one direction and then another line that sort of reverses that direction. And mm -hmm. it's usually about nature. And then I said to myself, oh, actually, I should also tell them that haikus are essentially jokes because that's how a joke is built. It's essentially a setup and then a punchline, which is sort of what a haiku is. So if you want to be funny, learn to write haikus because you can often be funny by writing a haiku. And all that became a post. And then I said, oh, I love that haiku about insecticide cans that I read to my students last year. I'll go find that and I'll close the post with that. And so that's the idea that I believe in the intersection of ideas. So that's, it's snowing outside. What can I write about the snowing? And then I say, after it's snowing outside, oh, I have a haiku about snow, right? And then I say, oh, I also, as a teacher, know something about the construction of haikus and how people think it's one thing, but it's not, right? Oh, and then as a storytelling teacher and a stand-up comedian, I also know that haikus are kind of just like jokes. They're a mm -hmm. formula for jokes. So I'll teach that too. Oh, and then that's right. I remember last year I read a, 
haiku about an insecticide can, and I love that, so I'll close with that. That's the intersection of ideas. So that is taking a bunch of things, bringing them together in a way they've never been brought together before, and that's inspiration. All of my novels are essentially, I have an idea for a novel, but it's never enough. And then I have another idea for a novel, and that's not enough, but actually if I bring the two of them together, now I have enough to write a real story. So oftentimes I think people sort of, they think inspiration is sort of a one track. I'm looking for a thing to write about. And what I'm always thinking about is I'm looking to bring in a bunch of different things on. into one thing. And that makes it a more interesting piece of creative art or writing, whatever you're doing. I love that. So here's my process with that. And you tell me where I can improve it. I have, because with my short form video, I have a spreadsheet and I have three different tabs with three different types of ideas. And then once a week I sit down and I look through and what I do is I just instinctually, like if I'm going through the list of things I collected that week, like, oh yeah, this, and it, it's really just more of an intu intuitive thing. And then I'll write something based off of that. I haven't come up with a better system to connect ideas than that, which is literally just a boring ass spreadsheet and visiting it once a week with my with my notepad. Is there another way to kind of connect the dots or I guess get better at doing that? I guess what I would do is I'd look at the idea you have and I would try to look at what I always think of it as like looking at the edges of the idea. So for a haiku, for example, it's a poem, right? But it's also mm -hmm. kind of like a way to write a joke and it's also misinterpreted by teachers. So we can fix that too. So I'm always looking at sort of like the thing, but then the edges of the thing at the same time. So regardless of what my idea happens to be on any particular day, I'm always asking myself, like, is there a branch to this idea that I haven't explored Damn, yet? Good. You know, and, and can I include that in what I'm saying now? Because one path is never really as interesting as if I can bring in multiple disciplines or multiple paths or, or intersect two ideas. A lot of times... I'll want to write about an idea, but I need a story to attach to it. I'm thinking if I have a good example. Oh, here's a good one. So my idea is in today's world, parents feel too guilty when they're not planning their children's days effectively, right? So, mm -hmm. so in today's world, unlike the world I grew up in, parents like plan the day when there's a day off. Today is President's Day, right? right. My kids are home. And my wife, I saw her frantically futzing about trying to find ways to fill my children's day off with trips to a museum or trips to a theater or to the bookstore, you know, right. suddenly she felt this obligation to occupy my children's time with meaningful activities, which is a lovely, you know, instinct to have, but also is kind of crazy because I grew up in a time when no one planned anything for me. And it was basically get out of the house and right. don't come back until mealtime. And I had a lovely childhood that worked out just fine for me. Right. So if I have that idea that we're sort of over programming our kids and we should let them figure out what the hell to do on their own yeah. and maybe just take away the screen, because when you take away the screen, they'll find sticks to play with, which is mm -hmm. exactly what happened to my son yesterday. You know, I took him sledding and suddenly he's playing with sticks. So if I have that idea of kids are overprogrammed, I need a story to go along with it. So I'll have a blog post that'll say children are overprogrammed today. They should figure out what the hell to do on their own. And it might sit there for three years. Until one day, like today, my wife is floundering around suddenly trying to get our kids to do something and overly participating in that activity. And I go, oh, now I can write about how kids are overprogrammed because I have a story to start with and then I can talk about it. So I'm yes. always looking for that intersection of story or the intersection of two news stories that sort of work off each other, those kinds of things. So good. I love the edge of an idea. And I also love that you touched on just the patience to be able to put something to the side and wait for the right story to come along for it. The, I have a blog post. I The oldest blog post I have is 16 years old, meaning I have a 16 year old idea. That's the, that's the one at the very bottom. Like that's the 197th idea. It's 16 years old and I have yet to use it, but it's a, it's origin was 16 years ago. I sat down and went, Oh, I should write about this someday. Something held on to you though about it. Cause most folks would just go delete it, but you didn't delete it. Well, why delete it? It doesn't cost me anything to have it. Right. It's cost me nothing to have it sit there in my blog software as my 197th item. I'm going to see what it is right now because I'm just so desperate to know what it is. That's wild. Oh, it's the reverse surprise party. Yeah, it's the reverse surprise party. <laughs> One day it'll yeah. hit you. Yeah, well, no, I know what it is. It's an idea that I have and I just have not had, I mean, 
essentially it's an idea I have for a way to surprise people in a surprise party. And it's perfectly great. And I could just define what it is now and explain what it is or better. I could wait until I have a moment in my life when I have a reverse surprise party or someone needs a reverse surprise party. And now I have a story to tell along with it. Damn. So waiting for it, but it doesn't matter if it sits there forever. It doesn't matter. It's not taking up any space. It's not like I have right. a limit on my gigabytes, you know, right. on the internet. So right. why delete it? I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. We'll wrap it up for this next little section. Uh, I wanted to touch on your presence. I'm going to be honest with you. When I've watched your stories, I'm a little jealous because I feel like I have a lot of weirdness that I got to get out of me and my body and the way that you're <laughs> able to deliver stuff, man, I have so much to learn. And I'll play a clip right here where we had our listener send in a question. I'll send it to you on Instagram. It's next week that he's going, he's gone to Atlanta a lot. He's won story bits there and he's really good, but it's his first time in New York and he sent in a question. How do you center yourself on stage in front of big crowds so that your mind can be clear? And you can just tell the story, not overthink it. Well, a couple of things. I'll give you advice from two other people because I, I don't get nervous. It's ever. unfortunate. You're never nervous, even at the beginning. No, never. It's a combination of genuinely, unfortunately, not caring what other people think of me. Which How my do wife's, you do that? You've got to bottle that up. I know. Sell well, it. My wife will tell you it's not always good. It doesn't always okay. work out well for me. Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not. Okay. You know, the other thing is, you know, you know, from hearing my stories, I was once arrested and tried for a crime I did not commit. I was put yeah. in jail for something yeah. I didn't do. I had a gun put to my head and the trigger was pulled. At that point, what mm -hmm. could possibly frighten me about standing in front of other people to share a story, right? So yeah. some of it is, con you know, comparison to the past. And some of it is I just don't care what people think. A lot of it is we, we don't have to care what, about what people think because no one's paying attention to us as much as we think we are. Pre like no one remembers us like we think they do so. Yeah. But beyond that, let me give you advice of two women who I know who have explained this to me really well. My friend Jenny, who does those improv storytelling shows with me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she's very nervous. And I make her get on stage without any prep and tell a story off the cuff. She hates me for it. And then she loves it afterwards. She tells me that most nervousness is anticipatory nervousness, meaning about 80 to 90% of your nervousness actually happens before you take the mic. And then most of it melts away once you begin speaking. Mm -hmm. So as long as you acknowledge that, as long as you understand, oh, I'm super nervous right now, but I'm not going to be nearly as nervous when I get to the mic, that'll help you feel better about what you're going to do. That's good. Right? And so then the other piece of advice comes from my 15-year-old daughter, and she has autism. And so one of her struggles is she always has to be doing something with her hands. And so what she's told stories. She's told stories at a story slam and at a big show. So twice in her life, she's gotten on a stage and told a story and she has a hard time with her hands and she knows it. She knows that her hands are a little more volatile, we'll say on stage when she's telling yeah. a story. But her advice is this, don't worry about the things you can't do well because you can't do them well and there's nothing to do about that right now. So focus on the things you do do well and stop worrying about the nonsense that you can't do. She gave that advice to someone recently. So That's she said, okay. I have a great vocabulary because I've read a billion books. She's read a billion books. She says, I have a great vocabulary. I understand grammar and I know how to tell a story because I've listened to my father. So I'm going to do all of those things really well. My hands are going to look ridiculous, but there's nothing I can do about them. So I'm not going to worry about the things that I don't do well. I'm going to focus on the things I do do well. Come so on. I would tell your friend, if you're going to sweat on stage a little and you're going to shake a little, I've certainly seen it before. I'll see it again. Don't focus on those things because those are things you're not doing well right now. Focus on the things you do yeah. do well and ignore the rest. That is that. easier said than done. And easier that's coming from someone done. who doesn't understand how any of those feelings operate because I'm never nervous about anything except when my cat disappears for 12 hours. What's one thing on stage that is your weakness though? What's one thing on stage that is my weakness? Your writing process, your ideation, anything to do with storytelling that is hardest for you? I guess when I'm on stage, the one thing I have a hard time with is a few times in my life, I've been telling a story and someone's just looking at me really strangely. And <laughs> I know it sounds weird. No. My curiosity over why this person is looking at me the way they are is so distracting to me that I just want to stop and say like, what is going on? <laughs> Why are you looking like that? Because in my head, when you get to a point, and maybe you're at this point already, where you can talk to yourself while you're telling a story. Okay. I know that. Okay. So not everyone believes you can do that. And then one of my friends 
didn't believe her for a long time. And one day she called me and she went, oh my God, I started talking to myself while I told the story. And so when I'm telling a story and I'm speaking to myself and I see someone looking at me with a weird face, the conversation I have with myself is always, I'm never going to know why she is looking at me the way she is looking at me. Cause I'm never going to be able to catch up with her. And I'm never going to be able to ask her like, this is my one shot. I could pause the story at an appropriate place to create a little suspense and say, please tell me why you're looking the way you do, but I can't. Right. And so that is super distracting to me in, in a storytelling context. Now, a lot of times I'm on really big stages where you can't see the audience because yeah. the spotlight and the, you're in a curtain of light and that's ideal for me. Cause then I don't have to worry about it at all. But sometimes people distract me. I guess that's my weakness on stage is I can be distracted by my curiosity over what people are thinking while I'm telling a story. Good answer. What about the pauses? I feel like sometimes I, I want to have more dramatic pauses than probably necessary. And it's interesting trying to figure out pacing. How do you judge that? I think that, I mean, it, it, eventually it comes kind of natural, but if something quick is happening in the story, you should speak quickly. And when something important is happening in a story, you should speak slowly and everything else is sort of in between. I can tell you that pausing is great and that no one pauses long enough because time is weird on stage. Like five really? seconds on stage feels like five minutes to the storyteller. Word, you know? yeah. So you should know that like a pause of three seconds on stage feels like three minutes to you and feels like nothing to the audience. So every pause can be longer than you think it can be. And the audience never cares if you take a long time to like set yourself up. I see people walk up to the mic and they, they're in such a rush to get started. And the audience isn't in a rush for them to get started. So I always tell people like, get up to the microphone, take a breath. I do Think that. about the first line of your story. Say it to yourself. Yeah. Put yourself in the place you're going to be in. Close your eyes. Imagine it. Open your eyes. And then begin telling your story. Don't be in a rush. Time is weird on stage. And once you get used to the stage, you are, you recognize the fact that it's weird. I get nervous a little, not nervous, but I get rushy when I am doing stand up. I'm rushing to the next joke because I'm not, I'm not nervous, but I'm worried that they're not laughing enough. And I hear myself doing it when I'm doing stand up. I'm like, slow the hell down. You don't need to get to the next joke as quickly as you think you need to. But that's a less friendly environment, a stand up environment. <sighs> You know, it's terrifying. Right. So it's, it's, it's just, it's a more challenging place. It's not terrifying because it doesn't matter in the end. No, oh, but it does. It really it, doesn't. Have you been oh. to, have you attended stand up shows before? I've attended and done it twice. Okay. So when you attend a stand up show and a, and a stand up bombs, can you really remember any of those bombs right now? You're right. I know, but oh. No one remembers. No yeah, one. You're right. Right. Your spouse may be in the audience remembers. Maybe your mother remembers. Your brother remembers, but nobody remembers. It's yeah. fine. Every stand up bombs. You should be like, yeah, I bombed every stand up bombs. It's if you fine. could bottle up that mentality and sell it, you'd be like a billionaire man. Well, I will acknowledge and I make sure I acknowledge it whenever I can. I am a white, straight American man with no physical disabilities or mental illness. So I am the most geographically, genetically gifted human being has, who has ever existed on the planet. And every single white, straight American man with no physical disabilities and mental illnesses should acknowledge the fact that the world is just paved with gold for us. I'm sorry, if you're a woman or you are a person of color or you're a member of the LGBTQ community or you're in a wheelchair or you're dealing with schizophrenia, yeah, the world's a lot harder. And so yeah. for me, it's easy for me to sound confident as well because I am who I am. And so I acknowledge that immediately. Thank you. Having said that, I also don't give a damn what other people think. And it's a pretty great way to be. <laughs> Tweet that out, y'all. Yeah. Listen, two things. One, thrilled I got to meet you. I just freaking love this book. Ate it up. It was so helpful for me. And it's literally, like I said, a textbook. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of the day to meet some Southern girl and let you pick <laughs> your brain like this. But the My second pleasure. thing I'm so excited yeah. about is you have another book coming out. I do. I didn't ask you at the beginning because I wanted to ask you now, what did you not say in here that you needed to write another book? Well, Storyworthy was found by the business community and the YouTubers of the world and the branding people of the world, and they made it into their own. So the story, story where they're selling extremely well today in the business world and lots of companies are using it, but it was not written for business people. It was written for you. It was written for people who just tell stories yes. in the world. So the new book coming out in June is for a storytelling book specifically designed for anyone who wants to sell something, market something, build a brand, become a YouTube star, uh -huh. become an influencer, all of those people. It's the tactical version of storytelling to help you build your business and your brand rather than just tell an effective story. So a lot of the things like homework for life are actually in that book because 
that applies yeah. to everyone. It, those concepts are expanded upon, but there's a lot of stuff in there about just sort of how do you apply actual storytelling to the work that you do? You know, whether you're an entrepreneur or working in the corporate world or you're running a nail salon or right. you're making YouTube videos or you're, a, I don't know, you're trying to become a Instagram influencer, which it seems like every one of my 10 year olds is trying to do. <laughs> Yeah. What's the book called? Uh, Stories Sell. Stories Sell. Awesome. Yep. And go ahead and pre-order that. And when does it Yes, come? you should pre-order it. It's coming out on June 12th. Good. But if you pre-order it, it really helps me. So I suggest you pre-order it in uh, quantities of at least a dozen. Think of Hell it as yeah. eggs and just buy a bunch of them and give them to your friends. Let's do that. That yeah. will be linked in the show notes. Please pick up Storyworthy. Pre-order this book. It's freaking game-changing, I promise you. Very last question. We'll get you out of here, Matt. What is something in your life right now that you are deeply questioning that you do not have the answer to? <laughs> Wow. It could be um, deep. It could be something really small, like where the hell was my cat? What's going on with this cat? Something in this season of your life, it's a big question mark for you. All right. So in the first Star Wars, A New Hope, Okay. when Luke Skywalker is flying down the trench to destroy the Death Star and Darth Vader is pursuing him, mm -hmm. Darth Vader says, the force is strong in this one. And he's not concerned about that. Because 20 years before, he wiped out all of the Jedi and everyone who sort of had any force ability. And yet now, at the moment when his largest and most powerful weapon is about to be potentially destroyed, he stumbles upon a pilot for whom the force is strong within him. And he doesn't take a moment to consider that in any way whatsoever. That should be deeply unsettling to Darth Vader at that moment, and it is not. And I'm not quite sure why that is the case. Did Darth feel the force strong in Han Solo? No, in Luke Skywalker. I mean, come on, pull it together. It's not Han Solo. It's you Luke said Skywalker. the pilot. The pilot, Luke Skywalker was pilot, piloting an X-Wing fighter at the time. I don't know. This was a very confusing one. Okay, answer. here's another one. Have you seen the movie Jaws? <laughs> a long time ago. Okay. You got to get some newer movies in here. <laughs> I, I've been watching movies with my kids. That's why this has come. No, well, I've been watching movies with my kids, and so we've been going to the back catalog. When Brody blows up the shark at the end, he shoots the air tank and it blows the shark up. And then seconds later, Hooper appears, the guy who was hiding underwater with the scuba gear. Hooper doesn't say, what the hell happened? How did you blow up a shark? He just laughs and goes, oh, so glad you're alive. The first thing he should be saying is, how did you just blow up the shark? But instead he, like seemingly knows that Brody threw the air tank into the shark's mouth and that the air tank remained in the shark's mouth enough so that Brody could take a high powered rifle from the top of the mast as it was sinking into the water and put a bullet into the air tank and blow up the shark. Hooper doesn't ask a single question. That also is a question that I have right now that is plaguing me. Those two questions are currently plaguing me. I've asked this question me. so many times and I've never had answers like that. That was okay. awesome. <laughs> well, they are plaguing me and I'm yet to figure out the answer to these things. I'll tell you what, man. Thank you so much for your time today. This is awesome. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure. <laughs>